Hey, we're back again. It's Jed Banger's Ball. I'm your host, Jed Mayhew. Uh, today on the show, uh, we're not talking about music exactly. We're talking about film. Um, but, you know, we do get into how music and film relate. Um, and so I'm really excited today. I have Calvin Lee Reader, who's one of my oldest friends. Uh, we've been making fucked up art together, whether it's music or film, since we were teenagers. Uh, in our past crossed in eastern Washington when I was in high school, then again in Seattle, and, and now we're back together in L.A. Uh, Lee uh, did a film called The Rambler a couple years back, and he was nice enough to put me in it. And I ended up being lucky uh, because at the time, I was trying to help him with the music on it, and I was trying to license a song for it by a country artist named Terry Allen. The song was called Redbird, and I was trying to track down the rights to the song and not having a lot of luck. And, well, the long story short of it is a guy named Stephen Brower, who I've since become good friends with, worked with Terry Allen. But Stephen and I also shared a studio space where our bands practiced at. And, well, one day we were hanging out, and I asked him where he worked, and he said, Vanguard Records. And I said, Terry Allen's Vanguard Records? And he said, yeah. And, uh... I explained the situation with the film and everything, and he said, sure, let me talk to Terry. And he ended up getting us the song for the film. Then a bunch of other crazy shit happened when the movie got made, but I'm gonna let Calvin talk about it, or as I always call him, Lee. I was trying to think of it today, like when when uh, when did we meet? I'd probably put it, uh, probably late 98. Because I've known you for a long time. I feel like it's earlier than that, though. Well, we didn't really make it out to Eastern Washington until at the till like May, man. I want to say it was ninety eight. It must have been ninety eight. So I was like, I was a senior in high school. Yeah. And you were living. Where were you living at? I was living. Um, I was either in Renton or West Seattle. I can't remember. It was. It was on. I was on the cusp. And I was living in Eastern Washington State. Yeah. So we were about three and a half hours. Something like that, depending on the weather. And then we met at the show, and you were in the River Rats. Yeah. That was the name of your band. Yeah. And that was the only place we could get booked, was Eastern Washington. The only place that would book you was these other teenage kids three and a half hours away that were, were writing you letters, or were we calling you on the phone? It was all about Derek, man. Derek set it up oh, okay. every time. Right, right. Derek Retard. Yep. Um, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. Yeah, he's he's a goner. Yeah. Um, so we met at the show. Was it was my band, the Ninja Boners, was playing as well, right? Or no? Well, I if if you say so, I remember seeing the Ninja Boners. It's all a blur though, because we did this pilgrimage so much. I can't even remember what the first time was over there, but I remember partying with you guys at like the hoedown and at the Richland County Fairgrounds. Well, the hoedown was like basically an old uh, sort of like dance hall. So I guess it got yeah. a hoedown. It was great. Yeah, and then we had the county fairgrounds where we also had shows. And then there was a Wenatchee place we'd sometimes go. I remember that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that we knew those kids from Wenatchee, which was like in the center of Washington State. So that was sort of like the yeah, halfway point. A little bit easier to get to. So why, I mean... So this is like 18 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, been really, it's been a really long journey from playing in these like punk bands. Yeah. And then now doing feature films. Yeah. Together. Yeah. I mean, mostly you, but I mean, you had me. Well, yeah, we definitely needed you for some of that stuff. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what I want to know, I want to start, we'll get into that later, but what I want to start, like, what was it, you grew up in Renton, Washington? Yep. So, like, 30 minutes outside of Seattle. Yeah. And what was that like, though? Um, y you know, it was boring, um, but it was fine because it was close to the city. Um, yeah, I was a skater, so that was cool. You get on the bus, uh, and, and skating kind of gave way to going to rock and roll shows and starting bands and stuff. That's what it was like. But you you always seemed to me like when I knew you back then and and your friend and our friend Nicholas, I, you guys seemed, or you at least seemed like you were kind of 
you had tattoos and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like really yeah. <laughs> early on. Yeah. Really bad tattoos, like really early on yeah. for like what we were doing. Yeah. Like I would have never thought to get like a prison y kind of style tattoo at that time. Yeah. Like now I think it's cool. Like the older I get, the more I think bad tattoos are cool. But at the time I was like, ah, oh, I gotta get like this, you know, tattoo artist or whatever to like do the tattoo that don't mind that noise that's just my dog running around in the studio here um <laughs> I, with his collar on i don't know what influenced that you know i uh, felt like you didn't i felt like you were sort of um allowed to just kind of do what you wanted to do like you didn't have you didn't have seem to have like the parental restrictions that some of us had no way i mean when my parents divorced, I was nine or something like that, and all bets were off from then on. Because my mom was like a single mom at that point, and then, you know, she had various boyfriends or whatever. And then, like, when she finally got with my stepdad, it wasn't like they were imparting any rules. And, and it wasn't like they were uh, – they weren't negligent. I mean, we were fed right, and, and stuff. But, like, I guess, you know, like my mom moved out of the house before I graduated high school. Like, there was, like, I lived alone while I was in high school because something about the government owning our house because of the divorce and the blah, blah. I don't really know. All I know is I had this whole house to myself for, like, the last three months of high school. All we did was, was like, rip it. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and, I mean, I think I was, like, kind of envious of that in a way at the time. Yeah, it was pretty wild. I mean, yeah, I kind of forgot about that. Yeah, I think, and, and you know, I mean, I, from what I know of you and, you know, we've known each other for so long now that I know a lot, but like, you know, you sort of, you, you don't, well, you had, half of your family is black. <laughs> well, that's kind of not true. <laughs> <laughs> In my version it is. No, I mean, like. That wasn't even where I was going, but it just popped into my head. Yeah, I mean, my stepdad is is black and, you know, for a while there, I live with my stepsisters and, and they're, and they're dudes and and they were and their babies so it would appear that way but it wasn't as if like that's my my only knowing you know it's not like i'm steve martin from the jerk it it was like i I saw i saw it coming and and you know i wasn't like born into it (laughs) well the other thing about it is it's not really that big of a deal at all obviously (laughs) but what's funny about it is i went to see i guess it, your Jerk Beast was your first feature film, is that correct? Second. Okay, Jerk Beast is, what was the first one called? Polter Christ. Polter Christ, okay. So Jerk Beast was the second feature film that you had made. And I went to the feature, uh, the, the, <laughs> the premiere. Yeah. And, and it's like at this, like, what was it called? Wiggly World Studios? Where was that? What was it called? Yeah, uh, well, I never understood it because it, it was the Northwest Film Forum, but they called every other thing the Wiggly World. Okay. I don't know what that was. I mean, I I really like that Devo song. Right. It's I, one yeah. of the best. But like outside of that, I don't know what they meant by that. It's not really important for the story, but I just I just trying to remember because it was <laughs> it was the Northwest Film Forum up on Nineteenth and Aloha right. back in the day. So I go down there in Seattle. Right in Seattle, we're living in Seattle at this time. I'd moved there, so we're living in Seattle together. We would kind of reconnected or whatever, and I go to the premiere for your film. And it's like all these punk rockers that I know, and we're like drinking beer in the streets and stuff. And then I'm just like, there's like a lot of black people here. Like, yeah. why are there so many black people for this movie? I'm just thinking, like, this is not what I think they would like. Like, this is horrible. Like, and then, yeah, when I watched the movie, I was like, oh, Lee's stepdad. <laughs> yeah, that was part of it. But then is in the movie. No, he's not. Oh, who was that guy? That was this guy, uh, Monzel. And he was a local actor. Oh, okay. So and then I think your dad looks like every local actor. <laughs> uh, you know, Monzel had a lot of people there. He didn't. He he hadn't had a lot of uh, film premieres, so I think he kind of he kind of went overboard. Some of those. Well, were, there was a scene. <laughs> there's yeah. a scene in the movie too, where Monzel. Yeah. Is you're in a band in the movie called Steaming Wolf Penis. That's right. And he's signed you guys, or he's your manager. Yeah, both. Yeah, both. We, we didn't know what it. We Who knew? Know. Yeah, but he he calls you guys a bunch of little n words. Yeah. In the <laughs> in the movie. 
Oh yeah, and then earlier we have a, a KKK guy uh, throwing it around, you know. But it's it's in the context that sure he's he's got his own public access show, and that's what you would see on public access. You'd just see white supremacists, fascists, whatever. It was all fair game. So we're just trying to show that. Yeah, totally. And it, yeah, it was great. It was just it just and me being I, I don't know how old were how old were you when that movie was made? Uh, I think we were twenty three when it finished. Okay, so I'm like twenty three. I'm twenty three as well at the time. And it just my maybe that was my first ever even like indie film premiere, and I was just <laughs> kind of had a very s- small scope of the world at the time, and I, I was did, just I did too. Yeah, we all did, of course. And I was just like, I was like, God, what is going on? This is so insane. Like I'm just sitting here with all these like people like watching this like insane film and 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 there's this crazy language. Yeah, I mean it's it's weird. That was that was weird. There was a lot of offensive stuff in there, but I I'm thinking that when anybody watches Jerk Beast, it like beats them into submission and they realize it's like for it, it, it it's so offensive it kind of like takes the meaning out of everything and that's kind of the point of jerk beast totally i mean i can i mean i kind of think of it in the same way as like like a trauma film or something like that where it's just it's parroting all of the horrible shit yeah i don't even know if we were aware of it but we, we something something like i don't that. think you guys were parroting anything i think you were just creating horrible shit in yeah. it in it in a in a sense of like how funny is it to just be like that's all we had. I mean, I don't even think our frontal lobes were formed yet, you know? So so we should backtrack, though. So Jerk B started out then as it was a public access show. Yeah. And I remember, you know, I think when I got to Seattle, like, you and I had hung out at shows or whatever, but we weren't, like, hanging out all the time or anything like that. And I remember uh, laying in bed with my girlfriend, and I think it was, like, Wednesday nights the show would come on. Probably. I and remember like, we were up against South Park for a while there. Right. Uh, and and it was like late at night. And we'd be laying in bed, and and I was flipping through the channel. And Seattle Public Access used to have a lot of crazy shit on there. Like yeah. it was like a way more extreme version of Public Access than most places. The only other pl- Public Access I've seen that like looked comparable comparable to Seattle was like New York or something like that. I've seen like crazy yeah. shows on New York, but I mean I could be wrong. But I remember Seattle being like, "Holy fuck, it's twenty four hours." A day. Yeah. Reverend, Reverend Bruce. And insane Shannon shit, Crane, you know. Fucking jerk beast. And a lot of it was like call-in shows. There was oh, yeah. bong hit championships where you would call in and try to do like a really long bong hit. And the oh, winner yeah. the winner was like, they would time it, you know, and then they'd say like, oh, uh, this dude from Volunteer Park did the longest bong hit or whatever. You that know? was a good show. That was like, that's going to keep you coming back. Yeah. Well, I used to call in and prank call them all the time. And then your show was just basically you guys... Yeah. Having people call in and you insulting them. Yeah. For a half an hour. That was it. So the first time, I mean, I remember I'm laying in bed and it comes on and I'm like telling my girlfriend, like, oh, I know that guy. Like, you know, it's my friend Calvin, you know, blah, blah. And we start watching it and she's just like, turn this off. This is horrible. Like, this is the worst thing. Like, and I'm like, I just want to watch it. You know, she's like, she's like, no, turn it off. Like, she was adamant, like, did not want to watch another minute of the show. I don't blame her. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I loved it just because it was <laughs> right. I mean, we're the same age, and it was so in my wheel, <laughs> wheelhouse of just like screaming obscenities at people. It was it was relentless. It was it was awful. Yeah, but in a, in the best possible way. I mean, it's it's still around. People people t- reach out to me all the time about Jerk Beast, unaware of the stuff I'm doing now, and like, where can I get a copy of it? Is there the episodes and blah blah blah. So it left an impression on somebody. Actually, we just we were just on a on a um, documentary about the Reverend Bruce Howard, the other, uh, that that guy. Yeah, he was like, didn't he have? He had like a black shirt on against a black background, and his looked like his head was floating. That was one of his bits. Yeah, yeah. And he was like a really kind of famous in Seattle preacher, and this fellow TJ's doing a um, not TJ Williamson. Uh, no, TJ Nordiker. He's doing a. Uh, a documentary about him and, and just a month ago me and the jerk beast and Marty sat down and, and were a part of that. And did you interview it in character or do the interview? No, I, I kind of feel like it's dead. I, I, I thought that would be really cool, but jerk beast's face has been re- eaten by rats. The actual paper mache mask. Yeah. There's, there's it was a, like in the basement or something. Yeah. There's uh there's a replica in, in England that's in pretty good shape, <laughs> but outside of that, 
That's not a joke. That's true. No, I, I know. I, it's just <laughs> funny that there is. Because I remember, so the band from the movie Steaming Wolf Penis yeah. that you guys were in, uh, the dog is running around the studio again, uh, you guys actually went and toured the UK. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Uh, just England. I mean, it was like Oxford. Isn't London. that the UK? Well, or no? It depends on how you you, right. you define it. It wasn't like we hit Ireland and Scotland. Right, and but no. you guys went over there to play like a, like a festival or something? Like a... Well, we found a distributor for the uh, DVD of Jerk Beast in, in England. And actually, that guy found us. And I have no idea how he did it, but this, this guy, John, who I'm still friends with, decided that he, he, owned, he owned two video stores in Oxford, and he decided he wanted to start putting out DVDs of indie films. And he wanted Jerk Beast to be the first. And he sold the, the DVDs at, like, um, Comic-Con-type fairs over there. And then he was like, well, why don't you guys come over here? We'll set, we'll set up a booth, and then we'll play a bunch of shows and sell DVDs. So, like, when we do the, the memorabilia is what they call it. It's not Comic-Con. In Manchester, you'll play in Manchester that night. Or when there's one in Birmingham, you'll play in Birmingham in that night. And then we'll, since we're already over here, we'll, we'll book you in Oxford and, and London and stuff like that. So we did that a couple times. Right. And it wasn't, uh, I remember you telling me this was uh, the guy who played like Jason was there too. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to party with you guys? Yeah, uh, Ari. Ari is the guy who was the little Jason and Jason in... in, in, in um, the first one, in Nightmare on Elm Street, or uh, uh, Friday the 13th. That's right. And he actually has a band called First Jason. And <laughs> yeah, and they're kind of I think they're kind of like a Ramones thing. At least that's what he looks like. Right. And then he was working a booth. You know that, remember that guy, Jordy, that the little baby? That Remember the French baby that had a song... Baby, just feed it, baby. And it was, remember that? I think so. He has a band now that sounds like The Clash. Whoa. Anyways, <laughs> first Jason. First Jason. I haven't really heard him, but he was there working the booth with that guy uh, who plays the the Leatherface. Like now, his name's Andrew. You'd recognize him from like any given Sunday and the, and the program. He's right. Like, yeah, yeah. He always yeah. plays a football. He kind of played like a takeoff of like Brian Bosworth. Yeah, yeah. So he's like a big football player guy, and now he's Leatherface. And they were working a booth together, and then they came and because when you see Jerk Beast, you just have to inquire. And they're like, "Well, you guys are American too. What are you doing over here?" And they're like showing them, and they're like, "You guys are playing tonight." So then those two dudes came to our little show in in Manchester and then we ended up like they demanded that we pl- start playing misfit songs so they could play with us so like Andrew and Ari started singing like these misfit songs even though they didn't know what steaming wolf penis was and even though Brady and Brian didn't particularly know any misfit songs we just kind of like came together and 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 kind of went crazy in this Manchester basement so then so after jerk beast i mean like i mean at the time i don't know what you were thinking but it just, it seems like you guys were doing this, like, making these films with your buddies, like, for yep. fun. I don't know. Was there, like, was there a, 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 a idea beyond that? Or was this just, like, let's just get together and make, like, make noise as if we're, like, a garage band or whatever, you know? Or Well, it was a little bit of both. It was, like, because we're from Seattle, we never took it too seriously because I think a lot of people from Seattle making something won't allow themselves to think too professionally, so we definitely had that. But we shot these on film, and we didn't shoot them on video cameras. We we made some of the decisions that an enterprising young uh, filmmaker would make, and then we made tons of decisions that... A enterprising filmmaker wouldn't make like sure go get the 16 millimeter camera buy the the right film stock and get the the lenses you need but then light it all with a shop light from <laughs> home depot right and then like sure you can go get some theater actors and try to get the best you can possibly do or you could just do it yourself so it was like diy met with like actual ambition to make it look like a movie so I, it was something something of both so did you did you direct a film or did you and Brady Hall direct a film or how did you guys decide how that was going to work? Well, when we got together, we just didn't really think about the titles too much. Like uh, I didn't know him uh, at all, and I had this idea for Polter Christ. A mutual friend told me that I should go hook up with Brady because he has a sixteen millimeter camera. I'd heard Brady's name around a lot because he was in a bunch of bands and stuff. He went to a different high school, but I knew his name. He was kind of a prolific uh, music guy and I'm like oh cool I always want to meet Brady anyway so I went and knocked on his door he already had the hair and the beard 
and we just started making a plan to shoot and you know since he's Jesus in the movie um he uh he needed to be directed so I would kind of set the camera and direct him and then when he wasn't in there he would kind of do the directing you know right so there wasn't you know, it wasn't. A, it wasn't. A you guys didn't weren't, weren't really thinking exactly like. Yeah. Specifically, it wasn't about titles. Well, because I always. I mean, at the time, like you know, and it, you you mentioned it being in Seattle. You know, I I just thought of you as like a band guy or guys that I saw at bars or whatever. And yeah. then And then when someone said like, "Oh yeah, he's making a movie or whatever," like it's kind of like, yeah, 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 right. You know, like yeah, whatever. Like they're not they're not really making a movie. You know, no, we're trying. No, and that's <laughs> what I'm saying is like, w- when did you start thinking like, okay, I'm going to start making movies, you know, as opposed to just hanging out and drinking like we were, y- everyone else was doing. Yeah, I just had this moment. I remember it really specifically. I was um, I was working construction and it was raining, and I was digging a ditch. I was in a ditch trying to dig out a water line, and I remember the mud just kind of kept sliding over the the line it was like an endless stream and then i i kept thinking you know i have a lot of ideas what am i doing in this fucking ditch yeah so then i've had those moments too i i i went and got a stranger and i was looking to see if there was any i a uh, place you could take a film class and then that's that's where it all started i found something called the seattle uh Inst- film institute um started going i went for about three weeks dropped out and um Met Brady. How old were you then when you when you enrolled in the twenty? Right. So then, so you make this movie, and so you're actually like thinking about making movies at this point. But uh, what were you like? What were you watching? Like, what were you like? Do nothing. Nothing. Like, yeah, I didn't like nothing. I had seen Better Off Dead a lot. I had seen uh, movies like um, Cannibal. The I guess I liked some. I liked some trauma movies. But I didn't really decide that I liked trauma movies until I took those classes at the um, Seattle uh, Film Institute because I was asked that question and I didn't have an answer. Right. And I was like, well, everything you guys are talking about, I'm sure, is really good, like Godfather and all the stuff I came to like later. Right. <laughs> but like uh, at the time, I was like, I don't relate to any of that stuff. My ideas are kind of crazy. I'm aware of trauma. So then I started watching that stuff more. Like I'd seen Surf Nazis and. I'd seen Toxic Avenger, but that was kind of all I knew. Right. So, um, so I think I forced myself to watch a bunch of trauma movies, and you know, I didn't really like them. <laughs> I mean, there's a couple in there, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. So, so I guess after Jerk Beast, was that like, were you thinking like this is the last like, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it serious now, or were you thinking, because then you started making short films after that on your own, basically. I would have kept going as crazy as possible, but Brady kind of wanted to go a different way. And I didn't feel like I could... I I felt like since he was going a different way, I could no longer um, make feature films. I was like, well, without our combination of resources and and funds, because, you know, we just put all of our money in it together, I'll never be able to make a feature film on my own. It was a two-man job. Um, So I was thinking that... uh, I'll still use Brady in a smaller capacity, but uh, I'm going to start making short films, and um, and then they they stayed pretty crazy. Yeah, you know. Uh, what was the next? Was it Pile Driver? Was the next thing you made? Pretty much, yeah. So then that's what your girlfriend Lindsay, who you guys are still together in this. When was that made? Two thousand five. Two thousand five. So you made three with her, like pretty quickly, right? Like yep. in su- in succession, the Pile Driver. Little Farm. Little Farm. And the Rambler Short. And the Rambler Short. And those were made between 2005 and... In 2006. Right. And so then the Rambler Short uh, gets into Sundance. Was that the first one? Actually, Little Farm was. Oh, Little Farm was. Yeah. So that premieres at Sundance as part of, like, the genre. Midnight movies is, like, it plays before. Can you tell, like, can you explain how that works? Yeah, um... It you know yeah you just submit and then and then you get into I I got into the shorts program and that's its own thing but since it was a midnight movie in their eyes they booked it at midnight in front of a uh, a horror film so it got to play as part of the midnight section and it kind of set me up in that world even though technically I was in the shorts program right and so I mean normally we're talking about music on here but like 
you, I mean, you've been in a bunch of bands, you've been in a bunch of punk bands, Steaming Wolf Penis, but like, <laughs> you've also been, <laughs> you would have been in the same band, but at different times. Yeah. Um, the Intelligence and, uh, I mean, like, I feel like the punk rock music or whatever bands that we listen to is probably like, is as big, if not bigger influence on the films than like films would be. Yeah. I think it is. I mean, that's all we talked about was bands yeah. for the most part, you know. I think it is. I can't really, I can't really put my finger on it, but I know when, um, when I kind of go to the film festivals and I hang out with other filmmakers who don't necessarily have that influence, I realize they don't have a lot in common with them. When like, I, you know, they they went to NYU or USC, and that's totally cool. But like, you know, I I, I was in a van, right, and digging ditches and playing the bass. You know, I had those those two things going and i didn't have tish what's tish exactly <laughs> i don't know what tish is yeah, who cares well okay so yeah it, so that's i mean that's a thing like i know that you've <laughs> talked about like um you were getting compared like to david lynch a lot like yeah and you had never like seen david lynch movies i didn't until now yeah i hadn't seen him like i it started off with the uh, little farm in particular People kept telling me, oh, this is so Lynch. And I, and I knew who David Lynch was, but I hadn't seen any of it. People would always tell me that it felt like Twin Peaks or something like that. I'm just like, that's just where I'm from. Right. Like, well, because David Lynch shot around where you grew up. Yeah. Like and, Twin Peaks or whatever. Yeah, and Brady is from Issaquah, and that's like the corridor to North Bend and all that stuff. So that's where you go to not get fucked with by anybody. So you can just go to the mountains and shoot on bridges and in the rivers and set up... So then I just started writing stuff to those areas because it was great set design because what I came to find is, you know, you can only fake so many rooms for hospitals and all that kind of shit or, or whatever. So it's better just to write it out in the woods and, like, you know, write your story out, set out in the woods. And that's that's where I started getting all these comparisons because I was doing weird things out in the woods. But, like, I was just born into that. Right. And I, and I was kind of upset that the people didn't know that, but... There's really nothing I can do to convince them, so I'm done trying. <laughs> right. Well, I, <laughs> and I feel like, I mean, so the the Rambler, the Rambler gets in the short film, um, and then you decide to do another feature. Yeah. The Oregonian. Yeah. So you want to talk about that for a minute, like what what happened with that film, or sure, what do you is that what you want? Is that yeah, you yeah. Want? Let's talk about that. What happened with that film? Uh, that was kind of a result of me being really frustrated not being able to make the feature version of the Rambler. I'd been sort of taken on a ride by a bunch of people. A few years had passed since I had moved to L.A., and I thought I was going to make the Rambler a lot quicker. So I was like, "Fuck it, I'm going to make one of these little micro budget movies that seem to be doing pretty well." But I'm going to do it, you know, our way, the way me and Brady had already established you know by shooting on film because i had worked at the film lab i knew a bunch of people to give me deals i still had my dp that was still the color timer there so i was like we still got the cameras we still got the film let's go back and do it old school but now with all the knowledge that we've um gained so we made this movie the oregonian in nine days five days of shooting in washington four days of shooting down here in california kind of pulled the resources between stuff that like you hooked me up with down here and stuff that I'd established up there, and uh, we made the movie for about fifteen thousand bucks. Yeah. yeah, and then that premiered at Sundance. Yeah, and I and I was a character in that movie. Yeah, what was it? Murph? Yeah, you're Murph. I was Murph in that movie. Yeah, and we shot that out in Joshua Tree, or uh, that was uh, Twenty Nine Palms. Yeah, well, how spe- depends on how specific. You Wonder are. Valley. Wonder Valley specifically. We spent uh, the high desert. Yeah, if you will. Yeah, and so then that that. That got into Sundance in 2012. Yeah, and I came to find out it got the last place, last slot, I should say, in the whole festival. It was the last film decided on. Really? That, I might be exaggerating that. It was definitely the last spot in the midnight section, and I think they told me it was the last movie they all agreed to actually play. Wow. Yeah, and that was pretty awesome. That's crazy. Yeah, and it, you know, it, it it's a film that got lucky. I love the film, but it's a it's an experiment. So yeah. it's a film that really got lucky. Yeah, it's a uh it's a it's a test of will to like you you have to be like ready to watch a movie like that. Yep. You're not just going to like you can't sit, flip it on. No, you can't. <laughs> you can't flip it on. <laughs> I mean, but it's on you can flip it on Netflix, so I think. 
Uh, it's on. It was. It on was Netflix. on Netflix. Now it's on Hulu. Everything kind of migrates from Netflix. They just to move Hulu. around to those. Yeah, they just kind of trade licenses. And now, unfortunately, uh, Netflix is getting really um, conservative. You know, they'll they'll play the weird big movies like Holy Motors, but if it's like a, a weird little movie, they won't even take it anymore. It seems like they're playing less and less stuff in general on there. It is. It's weird. It's mind control. Or they're moving towards like original content or whatever, like whatever they're producing, so they own it or probably. I'm not sure. It just seems like l- there used to be. I mean, I like you know when I'm when I'm tired or annoyed or like I'll just veg out and watch like the dumbest like shit on there like but like these like car shows or whatever but like now there's even less car shows on there lame (laughs) 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 uh yeah i i still do the dvds i think you know it's not a good endorsement to say netflix is great but like for like indie video stores unfortunately but like Netflix still has a great DVD selection if you if you have the patience. Yeah, dude, no, I mean when I was getting the DVDs, there was like I was yeah. watching a ton of insane shit on there that yeah. I was able to find that. It's great still, and um, I think people should kind of hang on to that because we've decided to run all the video stores out of business. We might as well at least support <laughs> Netflix's cash of of DVDs because if they stop doing that, now we can't get movies any fucking place. Right, and I feel like I feel like it's the same thing with music too, in that. Um, you know, with sort of the internet or the digital streaming or whatever it is, it makes it so easy for you to get something that's yeah. not not necessarily what you want, yeah. but something that'll <laughs> like pass the time. You know, like yeah. it'll just like feed that fucking need for a second to like, oh, I just want to watch something and chill out for a minute. And it's like, well, I have like these dumb ten reality shows that I can watch. Or like if I if I like had gone out and like rented a movie, I could have found something really cool. Or if yeah. I had gone out and like uh, bought a record, I could find, I could listen to something new and interesting. Or I could just put on Spotify and be like, I like the Ramones and feed me stuff that sounds like that. Or you know, yeah, it's weird to take take the time to like go home and listen to the record on Spotify. It's like I wanted to hear this Alan Parsons record. Yeah, and. I'm going to take time to do it. I'm not going to buy it. I'm just going to... That, that's weird. Yeah. But if you bought that record, then you can be like... Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I think that's why it's cool to, like, at least, you know, put the effort in to try to get the DVDs or get the albums or whatever and, yeah. and still have that, you know, until the record player breaks or whatever, and then you're like, fuck it, I'm just going to listen to my fucking computer for a month. Yeah. <laughs> until I can afford to fix the record player. I like the fucking um, audio service because I get to hear new bands, but I never find myself sitting and listening to the whole record. Right. It's just like, you know, I, I hear about a band, I need to hear it, and then, cool, now I'm done with it. Right. So. Cool. So then, so back to the film thing then. So, like, the Oregonian comes out, it plays Sundance, and then it plays a bunch of other festivals, too. You, like, go, you get to go all over the world with these films. Yeah. I mean, I, I went to Italy with it. The film went a lot more places than I did, but, yeah. I mean, some of them are, depending on the country or whatever, de- depending on their funding that they might have, yeah. like, they'll they'll bring you over or yeah. whatever to, like, yeah. present the film or whatever. Yeah, totally. So you get to do that one, and then and then how long is it before you decide to make another feature? Was it, like, I'm going to get in and make another feature right away? Am I going to, like, oh, write something? or? If it was up to me, it would have been that the day after Sundance. Right. You know, the, the Rambler was... The Rambler feature film was something I planned on making way back in 2007 when I had my first short at Sundance. And then, you know, that's when I had my first contact with Anchor Bay, the company that ultimately ended up funding it. Um, It just took that long for it to happen. So in that interim is when I made The Oregonian. And then when The Oregonian was done, I I found myself in the same waiting pattern that I had already been in. Um, uh, Only something happened and, and all of a sudden Anchor Bay found a way to make it happen. So we, we made it probably um, probably a year after uh, after Oregonian premiered a year and a half. Yeah. So so th- basically what I'm what I'm getting at is like you know it there was a crazy process to find the funding to make the Rambler and uh, the difference between the two films as far as like how they were made was like a huge 
leap totally in your life and career or whatever you know you went from making a film for fifteen thousand dollars with your friends yep um but we had perfected how to do that you know how to like make a movie for fifteen thousand dollars on film you know with your friends not just any of your friends right like the right friends do the right thing <laughs> right it's like we had learned lessons you know right so then, but then, so now we're, now you're going out of state. You're going to New Mexico to make a like a feature film yeah. with a crew, yeah, and a bunch of like people you don't know. Yeah, that's true. But you always you always work with people you don't know, even even on small movies. Right. You always get people that are like because you got to get somebody that's going to do yeah what you need them to do yeah whether you know them or not. And yeah, it's, there's always some weirdo that you you end up picking up for the rest of your life because of some weird thing you did on jerk beast right <laughs> you know, like, they just stay yeah because i mean i remember I, I just wanted to ask you like about making the rambler and you know what if there was like any stories that you remember because i mean i remember because i'm in that movie too and i remember yeah. coming out there and i flew into i think albuquerque with our friend matt olson who's also in the film and we got a rental car and we drove to roswell where the movie was being shot but on the way we stopped and we got a ton of fireworks yeah and then i thought it would be really funny to light off a bunch of fireworks just like in the middle of the scene oh yeah of the movie that would because i'm used to like that would have worked in certain situations yeah right but i was just used to like making films with you where we were able to like that would have worked in in the other scenes you know yeah but then i my i got my wits about me at the last second and i said because I I saw how big this movie was compared to like yeah. what I was used to, yeah. and there were trailers, and there were like a fucking crane. There might have even been a cop on set. That there was day. probably a cop. There was Natasha Leone was there. <laughs> Dermot Mulroney was there. All these people were there, and I was like, "Holy shit, this is like actually like a real movie." None of those people you just said would have stopped you, including the cop. It would have only been the AD. Well, see, I don't know these things, though. But, so, but, but I, that's the thing is, like, the cops or whatever, they would just assume, yeah, that's what happens in this movie, yeah. And the actors would just go along with it because that's what actors do. Right. But the only person that would have done a thing is the AD, and it would have been so ugly. Well, we were in, like, a... <laughs> we were, like, in a trailer that smelled like cat piss. Yep. And was just disgusting. And so... But, you know, in the last minute, I went to you, and I said, like, hey, Lee, I'm going to light off a bunch of fireworks in this scene. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like... Do not do that. <laughs> like you were like we uh, we had a safety meeting the other day, and it takes forever, oh, yeah. and it's gonna suck, and we're gonna have to like get a lecture and all this stuff, and it'll it'll be a nightmare. Don't light off any fireworks during the scene. Yeah, dude, it would have been like the worst you've seen since being bitched out of high school or something like that. Like, God, they take it so seriously. Right. Yeah, safety meetings. Because you know we had like. We had went like every day. It was like, okay, now you're going into the water, so we need a safety meeting. Now there's explosives because this person's head's going to explode. There's a safety meeting now. There's because there's fireworks in another scene and safety meeting and there's a fucking horse safety meeting. And you guys burned down a house, but then you weren't able to use it, so you had to burn down another house. Was that what happened? Mm-mm. Oh no, no. You just burned down one house. Burned down a house. Fuck yeah. You bought a house and then burn it down. We um. <laughs> It was it was someone's home. It was uh, <laughs> it was a condemned home that the fire department was gonna. I, that's not what I heard. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, it was a family of four. Yeah, we just moved them out. A single and, uh, woman. No, it was not unlivable. <laughs> As in most of Roswell. Yeah, what they did. Maybe what you're thinking is that like Jeff, um, the production designer, decided to re to replicate, like. Not the whole interior, but like a corner of the interior, so we could get a better shot. So it's like we did burn down that. We shot some interiors, did some, did a burn down, and then he's like, you know, we can get a better shot because there's a monster in this scene and fire, and and the Ramblers playing a song. It's like we can cover this better if I can. If you just give me half a day to replicate this one corner, and we can still light the walls on fire, um, but you know the house won't be burning down around us. So we can control it better. So we. Um, we did do that, and then we replicated. So maybe that's the story. You're. I I don't know. I don't, I don't remember. I do remember that someone came up to me and said, "Hey, uh, see that guy over there?" And I said, "Yeah." And they said, uh, "He's uh, Josh Brolin stand-in." And I said, yeah. "Oh yeah, that's cool." And they said, "Yeah, he's also done a ton of gay porn." Yeah, he <laughs> he was weird. He was he he 
he was a character man he he got ditched in Roswell by his girlfriend and his girlfriend took his phone and his wallet and this is an actor that's in the movie this is an actor that's in the movie yeah. and I can't right now I can't remember his name I don't think we should remember his name but he dis- but he, I but I do remember that he demanded we we credit him as just in case just in case I remember that too because I remember seeing like a like a late night movie on HBO and uh, one of the one of the credits was that uh, someone was named Justin Illusion. Yeah. Just in case. Yeah, it's weird. Do you have any? I mean, do you have any other stories that you remember from that shoot that were equally? I mean, I don't have any, like, whiz-bang, like, stories that are, like, just really funny, you know? Like, the whole experience... Oh, fuck, yes, I do. (laughs) Yes, I do. There's a fucking... Okay, so the Rambler goes home to, like... um, This is Dermot Rooney as the Rambler. Yeah, I played the Rambler in the short. Dermot plays the Rambler in the feature. And um, so, like, Rambler goes home to his brother. The the, the movie, you know, ostensibly is about a man who gets out of jail and then goes uh, to meet his his brother on this ranch for a job. But it's not really about that. That's just, you know. Sure. That's just what happens. So when he finally gets to this ranch and he meets his brother, you know, his brother's got a family, and then, you know, they have a newborn. And, um, you know, I, w- there was no baby. And I'm like, Wait, we don't have a fucking baby? <laughs> And, you know, it was like, it was that kind of crew, you know, they weren't bad, but there's some It mistakes. was in the house that you burned down. Yeah, some mistakes would, would happen. And I'm like, okay, so the first shot with the baby, you know, every, every, every movie with a baby probably featured, like, half the shots are a fake baby. Sure. Because you only can film them for, like, 15 minutes at a time. So it's like the first shot we see with the baby, it's okay, we'll do the fake baby because there's a lot going on. Like, the mom is on the phone, she's outside, and then the dad is out breaking a horse. So we have actually a wild horse in the background, and in the foreground, she's on the phone with the baby. No one's going to notice the baby's fake. There's, right. so, there's so much stimulation. But then when we go into the interior, we do eventually have to show a baby. So I start, like, like come on, you guys. you guys. Somebody has to get make this happen. So... I get a photograph from a phone, like, okay, I can get you this baby. And the baby, now I feel horrible, but the baby was like, it, it was like Latino, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm like... And the parents well, are supposed to be white. Yeah, and I'm like, well, the parents kind of have, have dark features. I feel horrible re, uh, racially profiling this infant. <laughs> it hasn't even had a chance yet. <laughs> and here I am telling it it's not white enough. <laughs> I know they're like, but I got thrown into this situation, and I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. We don't. You get the kid over here, and and, and we'll just see. These are the pro- This is what's going on with the Oscars. You know, there's just these are the same problems. Yeah, same problems. All so, the way down. Yeah. So I'm telling you, the photograph I saw of the baby was what appeared to be sort of light skinned, dark featured child, but you know, it might be able to pass if we kind of held the camera back okay right that was what the photograph looked like and it was like okay not the end of the world the mother shows up and she is Mm african-american and so is her child wow and it is not the photo that i saw (laughs) it's not even the same baby no and (laughs) i at least i don't think so (laughs) Because the photo, <laughs> the photo, you know what? My perception might have been colored. The, sh- the photo was shown to me by a, a, a girl who was Latina, and it was like, my friend can bring this child. And I was like, okay, cool. That's going to work because we don't have another option. And then when we get, I'm like, this is not the baby you showed me, or that's a younger image, and <laughs> its skin has filled in a little bit. And now I'm fucking... <laughs> racially profiling it even worse. And it's a different one, too. And But it, what do they expect? What do you mean, what do they expect? I mean, what do they think? They know that the parents are white. The crew was, like, laughing their ass off at me. They're like, "How? what the fuck happened? And I'm like, talk to the... Talk to the whoever it is that wrangles the extras because that was the person who was in charge of this, and then they give me this photo, and the photo looked okay, and they're like, the photo looked okay? What photo did you look at? You approved this? Right. And I couldn't make anybody believe me. 
And I'd done the shot list in advance, and one of the shots included a close-up of the baby. And they're like giving me shit the whole time as we're getting closer to the close-up of the baby, which was to be the final shot because it was the uh, the way you kind of shoot a baby. You know, at least that's how we decided because you only get a limited amount of time. Uh, and we're like, well, we'll get the wide. The baby will kind of worm around. We'll see it's alive. And then, you know, it's getting closer to that that close up and then you know the crews are giving me shit it's like so so you're gonna move in on that 50 with that thing <laughs> <laughs> and i was like the, the thing being the camera not the child right uh uh and <laughs> i was like so what did you do i didn't get the close-up because i was about to lose everybody's respect i had to fucking right. just be like fuck it shot it in a wide and i can't get the close-up because it's of a child and i'm not i'm not about to shoot uh a kid and, and change his skin color in post i'm <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So hopefully the uh, the wide is wide enough to see that it's a baby and nobody will really <laughs> see that the skin co- had, skin tones don't match. What if you had like if you had changed his skin tone and like hair and everything and post it would have been like that white chicks movie but like with a baby. I couldn't do it. And Buzz was there as well, the editor who would have handled that because he's also a great After Effects guy, as we know that. And he, he he wouldn't have done that. He's our, like, also our good buddy. He wouldn't have done that on principle. And and I and well, I Buzz hates white people too, so he wouldn't have been. No, he wouldn't have been okay. He would have made you keep it. Oh uh, yeah, I was about to lose everybody's respect, and it was a weird situation that I got thrown in. And that's that's what being a director is, man. You got to swallow uh, all kinds of shit like that. That's a great story. There's there's other shit too. I don't want to I don't want to throw anybody out of the bus. But no, yeah, there's a lot of shit where you kind of get locked into stuff and you just gotta. Yep, my fault. Didn't know. Yep, and that's just what it is. But so you finish the film and it and it premieres at Sundance again, and we all go to it. And then I mean I've I've been to a few of these with you, and I feel like you you sort of I don't know if you don't like it or you you have sort of a cantankerous. Uh, sort of relationship with the audience during the Q&A sessions? <laughs> or you start out, like, pissed off <laughs> after the movie's played? That's not true. No, that's not true? That's your... Uh, well, keep telling me. That, that, I mean, that's not where I'm coming from, but if that's what you're seeing, what else? No, uh, uh, just that, you know, I feel like you're, you have something that you want to say and that maybe you're, you're wanting... You wanted them to ask you the right questions, maybe. Well, sometimes they throw stuff at me. You know, they they make a lot of assumptions, which is cool. That's their place to do that. But then they they assume that I made the same assumptions that they do. And when I don't give them the answer they're looking for, things get a little weird, in particular on the Oregonian Q&A uh, that first night, if you remember. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. I sort of remember. I don't remember it as well as some other people. People tell me that was I remember a- we almost got in a f- street fight after the film because these guys were like, Go back to L.A. You're sucking up all the fresh air. Oh, with the snowboarder guys. Yeah, yeah, that happens. <clears throat> um, but what? So the but the Q and A. Oh, it just happens. You you show a really weird movie in front of a an, a Sundance audience. Some of them are ready for it. Some of them aren't. And and people don't know this too that like at Sundance, it's like there's a thing where people decide they're gonna walk out of a film. Yep. Like which to me like is like an insanely like kind of weird move like rude thing to do but like that's a thing yeah that's a thing where like i think it's kind of famous <clears throat> where at can you get booed you know if you if they don't like it it doesn't mean your movie sucks i think some of the best movies ever got booed but uh you know at sundance you, they, they do walkouts right and and i got a lot of walkouts under my belt right and that i mean that's what i'm saying is i remember when you did the q a for the rambler the first uh the first one the first thing you said when you oh, got up that, there. Oh, that, the, that was the intro, intro before the film. Oh, it was the intro before the film. Yeah, I kind of set the tone. <coughs> that, that's probably yeah. where you're coming from. I think so. Yeah, well, cause, because the Oregonian was such a hardcore experience of, like, you know, followers and then non-believers. It was like, we love what you're doing. I think you're a fraud. It was, it was one or the other. Uh, I, I did get pretty hardened, and when it came to introducing the Rambler, I'm like... Well, I'm just going to let everybody know what this is, and then I think I said something. You know, I'm the, I'm the Sunday, I'm the, I'm the walkout king of Sundance. So yeah, that's how you started it. Whatever. I just kind of kicked down the door. I had to sort of adjust their consciousness because in the midnight program at Sundance, most people are expecting a horror film. Right. So if I thought I said the right amount of things, 
I could start to adjust their mind that they might be watching an experimental narrative or something that was like going to give them the gore and the shock they were looking for. But if you want the girl in the t-shirt and the mo- and the and the and the, and the leather face or fucking whatever or the zombie, you're, you're at the wrong movie. You know, that's that's what I, that's the tone I was trying to set, and it wasn't in um, out of you know uh, disrespect to the audience. I was just trying to uh, set the tone. Got it. Got it. No, I, I didn't. I didn't mean. I didn't mean it in the sense of like disrespect towards the audience. I just meant it as like you want to like have like a, a, a maybe a verbal sparring match with them more so than like talk about how great the film is and how great it was to work with these people and you yeah, know what I mean. That's boring for everybody. Yeah, I mean, I I did have a great time working with them. Of course, asks, but you don't need to tell. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody in some regard enjoys the process of making a movie or making an album or whatever, you know, yeah. like just being able to get to do something like that. A lot of people are at their first time when they're at Sundance, a lot of filmmakers, and they'll go up there in front of them and they'll just kind of say the things they're supposed to say. Sure. But after you do that enough, you realize that you can get a lot more out of it by saying the things that you want to say instead of just kind of folding into the thing. Because you have four or 500 people staring back at you, it's kind of scary at first to to say the stuff that's on your mind. But after you've done it a bunch, it's kind of like, it's way funner to do this. Um, you're going to get written about a lot more if you say what's on your mind. And um, and in, in the case of the Oregonian and the Rambler, it was important to tell everybody that this was not going to be VHS or House of the Devil or some. and those movies are fine, but it's important to tell them that this is not that. And right. I, I'm not here to further my career in the horror world. I'm here to, to do this stuff. Um, so that was important for me. Gotcha. The dog, is, <laughs> the dog is now like whining and jumping around. Uh, so, anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. I just want to um, say. Uh, um, you want to do your cards? Oh yeah, no, I'm I, I'm gonna get to the game here. We're gonna play a game with Lee as well. Um, that's uh, Jess, our producer. They're chiming in, telling me that I'm forgetting something. But uh, uh, so the Rambler comes out. The premiere goes. It, it went. It went. I thought it went great. Yeah, like yeah, it was. People seem really stoked on it. Where 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 are we where can we see the movie now? Oh, it's it's everywhere. I mean, yeah, it's not streaming on Netflix, but you can rent it on Netflix. It's streaming everywhere else. It's streaming Hulu ev- everywhere else, um, and you can get the Blu-ray. Right, it's 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 in every country. And I know that just from knowing you as well as long as I do that, and whenever I ask you what's going on and what you're doing, you don't tell me anything. So if there is something you want to say that you're doing, feel free to. But if not, I understand. Nah, keep that quiet. <laughs> All right, well, then let's play this game then. So normally I play this game called uh, Band Names, okay. where I hand the guest a card that has a band name on it, and it's either a real or fake band. And they have to guess that, and then which we could do with you, but we're not going to. Um, and if it is a fake band... We will then maybe discuss what what kind of band this could be based on the name. What I'm going to do with you instead is I have uh, film titles of made up films. Maybe some of them are real films because it's much harder to come up with a film title. You know, you could be anything could be a band. You know, I disagree. I think band names are way harder. You think band names are way harder? Yeah. Well, I mean, a film title has to kind of say something about the film, right? Yeah, but you have 90 pages of screenplay to start picking those things, you know, with a band, and you're only one person coming up with the idea. The band usually has to come up with the name before you start playing, and you got to, like, four people have to agree. Well, and the band also has to, like, live with that name forever, too, yeah. like, and always be known as yeah. Steaming Wolf Penis. And movies can just take other movies' names. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. These Some of these can... Yeah. We're explaining the game too much, but... So, okay. it basically, it's a, it's a title of a film. You have to tell me, like, what you think, like, the plot of the film is, or if you just want to elaborate on it. Okay. Or what would this, like, what would be a Calvin Lee Reader film of this title? Here's the first one. Home delivery. Uh, this would be about a. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm. Have you, have you seen the film Inside Inside Moves? No. Um, I don't know why I'm thinking about Inside Moves, but it's a uh, it's a seventies film. Yeah, it, I think it, I think uh, who's the guy that, who's the guy that did um, the Omen? What's that guy's name? Uh, uh the director. Yeah. Oh, geez, I don't know. I love that movie Superman. though. What's that guy's name? <clears throat> anyway, 
I'm thinking of a, a, a guy who should have been a pro basketball player, but he had an injury, and uh, and then now he's a bartender. Wow. Yeah. That's great. It's great. And he tries out for the Golden State Warriors with a fucked up leg. And uh, and I'm thinking Home Delivery would be a version of that film, only only instead of a bartender, he's, he's like a UPS guy. Oh, wow. Okay. That's Home Delivery. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought Home Delivery was the basketball one. No, that's called Inside Moves. Oh, okay. That, that, I'm, so I'm stealing Inside Moves plot line. Got it. And I don't know why, but that's what I thought of when I saw this. I think it's great. I'd, I'd love to see Home Delivery. Uh, here's the next one. Santa's free hand. Satan's free hand. Oh. Not Santa. Satan's free hand. <laughs> I kind of like Santa's free. Yeah, so I'm going to go with Santa's because yeah, that's, that's how what you read I read. It. Yeah, it's first, you know, it's first come. Um, Santa's free hand is a fucking porn. Santa's free hand is a porn? Yeah. Okay. Satan's free hand is um Satan's free hand is probably kind of like a faith-based movie. It's probably not as as evil, you know. It's probably like like an after-school movie kind of. Yeah, I think it's like Satan's free hand is like a, a guy who wants to be like a a Satan worshipper, but in his free time he actually finds God. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll keep it at that. All right, here's the next one. D-Day. Um, D Day. So I mean, you know, we got we got we got Normandy, but like, what else do we got? Diarrhea. Diarrhea Day. That's what I was thinking. The day. Yeah, just a day dedicated to that. <laughs> I was thinking it's like a guy that just can't stop shitting, and it becomes a problem for more than just him. What? Yeah. You know, what if it's like. Did you ever see that movie uh, tape, that Link Later movie tape? Yeah, a long time ago. Where like Uma and um, and Ethan can't get out of that room. Right, they're and in I, a hotel room. And I think that Uma like reveals that she was like sexually assaulted by him. I think it gets pretty heavy. Yeah. What if he had diarrhea the whole time, and the reason they didn't leave is because he just couldn't get off the pot, you know? Right. So he does the entire movie from the bathroom door. Yeah. So you hear that? No, that she's in there with him. <laughs> He's it's just, basically we're just shrinking it from a hotel room to, to the bathroom only. That's what I think. Okay, I like that. All right, here's the next one. Hermit versus hipster. This is um, something that would definitely take place out in Wonder Valley, uh-huh. where like a desert dweller who lives off of PBR, like Steve. Remember Steve? Desert oh yeah, Steve. Uh, we called him. Uh, didn't we call Saint him Steve? Saint Stephen? Yeah, like the Grateful Dead song. This is just like yeah, Saint Stephen versus us. Right. He's just gonna like invite us in and 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 show us what it is to, to only drink PBR and and nothing else. Yeah, Saint Stephen. Yeah. Cool. I love it. All right. Here's another one. Little Bigfoot. This is one of your movies. <laughs> I'm using this to promote. Yeah, Little Bigfoot is a is a soccer movie, I believe that you you came up with. It's not a soccer movie. It's a What is it? <laughs> I think there's a scene where they play soccer. That's what stuck out to me. Yeah. <laughs> because because they're playing uh that song Walking on Sunshine. Yeah. And it's a tiny Bigfoot playing soccer <laughs> with other children. So it's really a Bigfoot. He's just not growing up yet. He's a child Bigfoot. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what it is. When he grows up, does he does he grow out of it, or does he just stay? Does he grow up to be a big? The movie's not that long. Oh. It's only an hour and a half, yeah, so, so he stays a kid the entire. <laughs> <laughs> that's not your problem. <laughs> no, it ends like one of your movies where he's just like staring at something. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. There's no ending. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to do a silly comedy film like that little Bigfoot about a child Bigfoot who goes to school and is adopted by a family and then, and then they're just the most ambiguous <laughs> ending. He ends, yeah, with uh, some kind of existential crisis, but it's all internal. Exactly. Uh, moving on. Clown college or clown colise. Clown college. Um, this this is a movie about going to film school here (laughs) (laughs) that's it that's it all right two more we're gonna cut it short here we go the man with the golden dog 
that right? Because yeah. it almost looks like man with the golden dose. Well, I wasn't worried that you were going to say man with the golden dong, but dog, man with a golden dog. Um, I think it's a noir film. Yeah, that's. Let's call it a noir film. That's a really good way to go, and it would be cool because you wouldn't know if the dog was actually gold or not. Like, it could just be painted. Well, like I don't remember what they say the Maltese Falcon is made out of, but like you can't tell, right? You know, because it's black and white. You know? Yeah, exactly. So like the golden dog could be like, you know, a precious sculpture that's made of gold that's also a dog. <laughs> But they could save money on the actual production because you wouldn't know if it was actually gold or not. What if it was a real dog that was actually made out of gold, though? That's a way better idea. Keep going. Like, I mean, this dog is figured out how, not necessarily figured out, but just been put on the earth with a gold body. He's actually made out of gold, but he's like his organs are gold and his like tail is gold and he shits gold. He kind of sounds like a Terminator dog. Just exactly. Made, made out of different material. He's made out of an alloy. Yeah. So maybe he's not pure gold. Yeah, but it's a compound. Gold is in there. There's gold in there. <laughs> and so everyone wants this dog. Um, yeah, so the dog's on the run. With this man. With the man, the man Who with the golden him. dog. Yeah. So it's kind of like Plague Dogs. Did you ever see that one? I didn't see that. There's Well, it's just it's two dogs, but this could be, you know, <laughs> dog and man. Yeah, I, I think it's like Max von Sydow is the man. Cool. All right, this is the last one. This one's for you. My Dumb Brain. <laughs> That's an 80s movie. Okay, My Dumb Brain. I don't know why I need to tell you what it is. Uh, it's a movie from the 80s. My Dumb Brain. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. My Dumb Brain. <laughs> just keep repeating the title. Mm-hmm. No, it's almost there. I'm almost there. It's almost like watching the title come to life as you figure out. Yes. My Dumb Brain was the original title for Kramer versus Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. We're going to end on that note. Calvin Lee Reader, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you, buddy. Right on. Well, this has been another episode of Jet Bangers Ball. I want to thank all of you out there for listening again of course as always and our guest Calvin Lee Reader check him out you can find his films on Netflix he's up on the internet he writes and reviews movies himself so look him up check him out if you're into weird stuff he's your guy as always Jed Banger's Ball is brought to you by This Is Not A Pipe recorded here in Los Angeles California at the Green Street Studios live it live it